Welcome to the worship this morning at Troy Church of Christ. We're glad you're here. And we will begin by singing the uh, first song, I Will Sing the Wondrous Story. Let's stand as we sing the first two songs, please. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me, how he left his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. I was lost, but Jesus found me, found the sheep that went astray. Through his loving arms around me, moved me back into his way. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. He will keep me till the river rolls its waters at my feet. Then he'll bear me safely over where the loved ones I shall meet. Yes, I'll see the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. Fairest Lord Jesus, ruler of all nature, O Thou of God and man, the Son, Thee will I cherish, Thee will I honor, Thou my soul's glory, joy, and crown. Fair are the meadows, fairer still the woodlands, robed in the blooming garb of spring. Jesus is fairer, Jesus is purer, who makes the woeful heart to sing. Fair is the sunshine, fairer still the moonlight. And all the twinkling starry host, Jesus shines brighter, Jesus shines purer than all the angels have can boast. Be seated. Have you ever stood at the ocean with the white foam at your feet? Felt the endless thundering motion, then I say, you've seen Jesus, my Lord. Have you seen Jesus, my Lord? 
He's here in plain view. Take a look, open your eyes, he'll show it to you. Have you ever stood at the sunset with the sky mellowing red? Seen the clouds suspended like feathers? Then I say, you've seen Jesus, my Lord. Have you seen Jesus, my Lord? He's here in plain view. Take a look, open your eyes. He'll show it to you. Have you ever stood at the cross with a man hanging in pain? Seen the look of love in his eyes? Then I say, you've seen Jesus, my Lord. Have you seen Jesus, my Lord? He's here in plain view. Take a look, open your eyes, he'll show it to you. Have you ever stood in the family with the Lord there in your midst? Seen the face of Christ in your brother? Then I say, you've seen Jesus, my Lord. Have you seen Jesus, my Lord? He's here in plain view. Take a look, open your eyes. He'll show it to you. That one. Good morning. I know everybody can hear me anyway. I got a big mouth, but it makes, makes it better when the mic's on. Uh, I hope everybody is uh, glad to be here this morning. It's a big week uh, for several. Uh, this is the week that uh, we all, I say we all, y'all all go back to school, right? I know everybody's having so much fun looking forward to that. Um, as we like to do here, uh, we're going to say a special prayer in just a moment for all of our, our students and teachers. Uh, it's a big deal, right? We get to go and start a new school year, lots of new challenges and things coming up. Uh, and so, if we would, I'm going to ask all of our students and teachers, those college students, uh, anybody that's starting some form of education in the upcoming semester or whatever, I want you all to come up front, please. It's just going to be awkward if I have to stand here. Teachers as well, come on. There we go. <laughs> this is always my favorite part to watch the teachers tell other teachers that they have to go up there. So uh, for those of you that are, aren't aware, you are aware now, these are all of our kids that are going to be going back to school in some capacity starting in the fall. Um, and it's a good thing to have them up here, not just because we love you guys and we understand that the impact you guys have the ability to make on whatever environment that you're going to be in, uh, but these are those that uh, over the next couple of months are really going to need the extra encouragement. 180 days. 180 Very sorry. 180 days. Uh, they're all going to need encouragement. So uh, we're going to say a prayer uh, on everybody's behalf at this time. If you would bow with me, please. Uh, dear God, we love you so much, and we thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here together this morning. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, at this time, we, we come and want to uh, pray a special prayer uh, on everybody up here. Uh, we're going to start school as, as students, as workers, and dear Heavenly Father, we know what a challenge this can be. 
Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we pray at this time that you just give each and every one of them uh, strength and encouragement, uh, dedication, excitement to uh, to be able to go and, and start a new chapter, whether it's a new grade, uh, just a new school year. Heavenly Father, we pray that uh, you be with and guide each and every one of these. Heavenly Father, we pray that uh, we always remember that whatever environment that we're in, we have the ability to glorify you. We pray to Heavenly Father that we do that every single day better than we did our last. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all. I have just a few more announcements before we continue on with our worship. Uh, we do want to offer our, our deepest sympathies uh, to a number of families. Our deepest sympathy, first off, to the family of, uh, of Debbie James and the passing of her mother. Uh, we also want to express uh, our, our, our love and, and prayers for the Parrish family and the passing of, of Jamie Parrish. Uh, so please be sure to keep both of those families in your prayers and thoughts moving forward. Um, just a reminder, we are taking uh, sock donations. Uh, Troy Church of Christ has agreed to donate 75 pairs of men's socks. These are going to be donated to uh, the Obion County Fair Workers in just a few weeks. The deadline to turn those in is going to be August the 10th. Okay, so you still have just a little bit of time, but 75 pairs of socks, there's a basket, will be right outside or just inside my office, depending on what time you show up uh, during the week, that says sock donations. You can just leave those there. But we're looking for 75 pairs of socks. If you have the ability to donate to that, please do so. Uh, we also, this is a, a inter that's an interesting announcement, we just... It's a dual part announcement. This is Charlie asked me to make this announcement. This is a thank you and a please help announcement. So, uh, recently, a lot of our, our men here that serve have been serving uh, repeatedly uh, in a number of different roles. And we are incredibly, incredibly thankful for every single person that, that asked to serve uh, and that does that and helps alleviate some of the pressure. That being said, if you are interested in serving in some capacity, please let Charlie know, right? If you want to say an opening or closing prayer, uh, if you're looking to help serve on the Lord's table, any anything like that, please let Charlie know uh, so that we can you know start having a, a broader rotation of, of men to do that. Uh, there's currently a sign-up sheet in the foyer. If you want to host one of our family devotionals, those will be starting back in August. Uh, the Fifth Sunday Fellowship with Exchange Street is today at 6 p.m., and because of weather, we have moved the location. So that will be here at the building. Uh, it's, it's wet, and we're super incredible for the amount of rain that we have, and we're supposed to get it all afternoon as well. So we are moving the location from Trojan Park here to the building, over in the Activities Building, uh, still to have a, a cookout. We still are looking for people to bring uh, sides, drinks, and desserts to that. So, uh, But the hamburgers and hot dogs, everything will be, all of that will be provided. So just a, just a reminder there and a, and a notice that the location is going to be changing. You can still show up to Trojan Park if you want, um, but it might be kind of lonely, so just keep that in mind. August the 19th, we will be having a tailgate to kick off the Obion County Central football season. Uh, this is going to be a joint effort with Exchange Street, so please be sure that you put that on your calendar. That's going to start at 530, uh, and we're Again, I'm, I'm changing locations on people. It was going to be here in the parking lot. We are working something out with Exchange Street to have it actually at the high school um, in a, in a marked-off area over there to, to tailgate. So just stay tuned for that. We will have a definitive answer for you in the next couple of weeks. And then just wanted to make everybody aware of, we'll put this flyer out on the information station, but this is a, a back-to-school bash that's open to the public at uh, Kiwanis Park on August the 20th. Uh, so just keep that in mind if you want more information. It'll be out on the information station. So any other announcements we need to make this morning? Thank you. Just for your information, Jimmy Smith and I offered to lead singing, and Charlie laughed at us. <laughs> Let's go to our Father in prayer. Father in heaven, we have a lot to be thankful for, but we also have many that we're concerned about, and we need your intervention beyond what we can do. Please be with Steve and Beth Muse and their situation and her recovering from her eye surgery and also with their granddaughter in Memphis and Nashville. Continue to be with the Brenda Aker and the whole family and the loss of Royce and Shirley Dobbins and Jesse Whitesides and decisions he's got to make about his situation in health care. 
be with Faye and Aaron Tittle, Vernon Parker, Barbara Long, and also the Joyce Gwaltney family, Debbie James and R.C. and Pat Parrish and Mitzi and the whole family there and the loss of R.C.'s brother. Dear Father, we have more that we don't know about that you know everything and you can bless and help and touch every heart. Dear Father, strengthen us, give us courage. Please bless our children as they go back to school. Bless our community, bless our country. And please help people to see that without you, there is no tomorrow. Because we know from history that the only time that Israel a lot of times looked up to you was when you knocked them flat on their back. Dear Father, we pray that that doesn't have to happen to us. Help us to have faith and to demonstrate our love and that people in the community will know that we are your disciples because of the love we have for you and for each other. Forgive us of our sins, guide us, protect us, and bless our worship today. And thank you for sending Jesus to remove our sins because we couldn't. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we contemplate the Lord's Supper, we'll sing, He Paid a Debt. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. He paid a debt at Calvary. He cleansed my soul and set me free. I'm glad that Jesus did all my sins erase. I now can sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. One day he's coming back for me to live with him eternally. Won't it be glory to see him on that day? I then will sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. Think about Jesus as the bread of life. The bread you partake of is symbolic of the body which he died to give you life. Jesus is the bread of life, John 6, 35. As you share in that bread today, are you sharing him with others? Are there others you could share with him? Think about those who are yet thirsty and hungry for an answer to their soul's deepest longing share the Lord. Bow with me, please. Father, we ask that you be with us now as we partake of this bread that represents your son's body who died on that cross for our sins. Father, we just ask that you be with us and help us to put all the cares of this life out of our minds and go back to that day when Jesus gave up all for us. Be with us now as we partake of it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
think about the blood of the Lord, if you partake of the fruit of the vine, it might be a good time to ask the Lord to help you never do anything that would show a lack of appreciation for his spilled blood. Hebrews 10, 29. You might ask him to help you show him more each day how much his blood really wants to means to you. Think about the cup he had to drink, Matthew 26, 42. It was a dreadful cup. It contained mocking, scourging, spitting, nails, and abandonment. He drank it down to its bitter dregs. The cup you drank of during the supper spared you from all of these things which you deserved. Now, now won't that keep you thoughts focused on him? Father, be with us now as we partake of this cup that represents your son's blood that was shed on the cross for us. Be with us, help us to examine ourselves and receive the blessings therein. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Second Corinthians 9, verses 6 and 7. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Be with us now, Father, as we give back to you a a portion of that which you have so richly blessed us with, especially in this country, Father. Just be with us and help us examine ourselves and just always give back to you cheerfully. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. His name is Jesus, his name is Jesus, oh how he loves you and me, oh wonderful Savior sent from the Father, oh how he loves you and me. His name is holy, His name is holy, His name is holy to me. Oh, wonderful mystery, how He could love me, His name is holy to me. 
Children's Church can be dismissed as we stand and sing the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. I will not falter, I will not faint. He is my shepherd, I am not afraid. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. He will uphold me all of my days. I am surrounded by mercy and grace. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. I will not waver walking by faith. He will be strong to deliver me safe. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Be seated. Good morning. It is a great day to worship our God. Amen? Amen. I'm excited that you're here this morning. Uh, as we mentioned before, I know that this is a day that uh, comes with a bit of a mixture of excitement and for some maybe some anxiety, uh, but I hope that what we do here this morning will help start your week off on the right foot and uh, really encourage you to have a, have a good rest of the week, right? I mean, that's, I, I've always loved the ability that we do to get to start, uh, start the week worshiping together. I love the last song that we sang, the, the strength of the, 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 the joy, the, the joy of the Lord, that thing, yeah. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I wanted to say the strength of the Lord is my joy, which is also a true statement, just so you know, but that you guys would come up to me and say, you misquoted the lyrics, which is true, I would have, but anyway. Um, one of the things about being the church, one of the great blessings about being the church is you and I have the ability to petition one another uh, for encouragement, for prayers, literally anytime we want. Uh, and it's easier now to do that today than it ever has been, right? Because we've got so many different ways of communicating to, with one another, right? You can, uh, you can send texts, you can send emails, uh, you can still send snail mail if you're trying to reach Gene, which is okay, he'll get it eventually, right? Uh, but we, we enjoy the ability to reach out to one another. Uh, and I hope that we don't forget and we can take advantage of that all the time, not just while we're here at worship. However, while we are here at worship, in a few moments we're going to sing an invitation song, which is a time that we've set aside that you can make those needs or desires, or if you've got prayers, or here's the fun part, if you've got something that you want to celebrate, that we can rejoice with you, you can let that be made known too. Uh, I don't think we emphasize that enough, but at the end of services during that song, we'll have a couple of our shepherds in the back, and I'll be up front. You can talk to the person next to you 
Uh, we really, really would encourage that. This morning, we're going to go through a lesson that we've entitled Mercy in Exodus. Uh, and this is a, a, actually a lesson that's kind of inspired from a, a previous sermon I've heard uh, from the guy named Justin Rogers. If you're familiar with him, you'll know what a, an excellent scholar he is. Uh, but this is uh, something that I think is really, really interesting to talk about mercy and Exodus. The reason I think that this is an interesting topic is for a couple of reasons. Number one, the word merciful, as it's used in Exodus chapter 34, which we just read for us, right? Uh, thank you for that, Dylan. Just read for us a moment ago in Exodus 34. That word merciful to describe God, right there, it says the Lord, the Lord, which is actually a uh, Hebrew for God's name. That's Yahweh, depending on which translation that you use. That characteristic, that word merciful, as it's used in that verse, is only ever used throughout the Bible to describe God which I find really interesting. I don't misunderstand me. The Bible commands us to be merciful, right? The Bible encourages us to be merciful to one another, to be compassionate to all that we interact with. But as a character trait, that word for merciful in Exodus 34 is only ever used or attributed to God. And the reason is behind that is the fact that you and I are not naturally merciful. Right? There's not a lot of mercy that's, that's naturally stored up in us. Right? For example, I, I've said it before, I know Dylan has said it in our Bible class recently, uh, when you're born as a child, right? babies, most selfish individuals on the face of the planet, right? there is no mercy from a child. If it's hungry, it's going to scream at you until you do something about it. Right? If it's uncomfortable, it's going to scream at you until you do something about it. There's not a lot of natural mercy. You and I are not mercy. God is. And so I find that to be really interesting. The other reason that I think this is an interesting topic is because of how often we or the world misdefine what God's mercy is. And we do that in a number of ways. We either misdefine it because we, we don't like to define mercy as it's defined in Scripture, or more than likely what happens is, is we want to define God as only mercy, as only grace, as only love. And we like to remove the just part of who God is away from the equation, which you cannot do, right? You cannot have a God that is perfectly merciful if God is not also perfectly just. And so this is why this is all really interesting to me. And that, that particular uh, thought comes across in today's world, and you try to rationalize that position by taking the moral high ground, right? If God was truly merciful, if God was truly forgiving, if God was truly love, then He wouldn't allow suffering. He wouldn't condemn anybody to hell. He wouldn't, and so on and so forth. And you cannot have God's mercy without God's justness. And so if you will, open up your Bibles to the book of Exodus because we're going to look at this idea of mercy and why God is merciful in every fiber of His being, but that does not mean that you and I get to live our lives however we want to without consequence. So open up your Bibles to the book of Exodus. We're going to start in chapter 2, by the way. We're actually going to be all through the book of Exodus, but we're going to start in Exodus chapter 2. And the reason that I think that this is a really fun place to, to study God's mercy from is because when you look through the entire book of Exodus, we see kind of where the Israelites come from, right? We see how they're going to be led out of Egypt. We see how they're going to be freed from, from sin and from slavery and basically given a new lease on life. Exodus is where we see a lot of the promises of God in Genesis start to come to fruition. And so it's a really interesting concept. Exodus has so many signs uh, pointing to the coming uh, Messiah, which is Jesus, and it's pretty incredible to look at. And so concerning God's mercy through the book of Exodus, we're going to look at three things this morning. The first thing I want us to look at concerning God's mercy is God demonstrates His mercy in listening. I think this is really interesting. Look at Exodus chapter 2. We're going to read verses 23 through 25. It says, After a long time the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned because of their difficult labor, and they cried out. And their cry for help, uh, and, and, excuse me, and they cried out, and their cry for help because of the difficult labor ascended to God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob, and God saw the Israelites, and God knew. Really interesting verse. But did you know that it takes mercy to listen to people? Nathan, that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? It doesn't really take any effort to listen to people, but it does. It takes a lot of mercy to listen to people. We may not always think of it that way, but it takes a lot of mercy to listen to somebody, especially somebody who is struggling, right? I mean, or even in just listening in general. Right? How many times as a parent, I'm just curious about this, uh, how many times as a parent you have found your kid doing something wrong? Ever happened to anybody? Parents, show of hands. You can raise your hand if the preacher asks you to. Okay, that's third kings. Uh, you're allowed, yeah, so you, you've caught your kid doing something wrong, right? And sometimes it's something really wrong, 
right? And so you get really frustrated. And your kid goes, but mom, but mom, but mom. And you go, no, 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 no. I don't want to hear it, right? Anybody ever done that? Not a sing- My parents are probably the only ones that have ever done that, I know. But I know no parent in here has ever done that. It takes a certain amount of mercy to listen to somebody. As a parent, when that was going on, you didn't feel very merciful in that moment, did you? Or maybe you thought, no, I'm not going to listen to you because that's my way of being merciful, right? It's because if you keep talking, I'm just going to get more and more and more angry. But it's one of those things that it takes mercy to listen to somebody. It takes mercy to listen to somebody, especially when somebody's having a hard time. Maybe you've ever found yourself listening to somebody who's struggling, right? Who's, who's complaining about how hard their life is right now. And they are trying to, to kind of really confide in you why their life is so hard. And maybe you have ever thought or, or even worse, maybe you've said out loud to somebody, man, just get over it. Right? That's not that big of a deal. Why don't you suck it up? Move on. Stop worrying about it. Maybe we've gone so far as to tell somebody why I've got it harder than you do, so you really should just stop complaining. That's not very merciful. It takes mercy to listen to somebody. See, God doesn't react that way to us. We've got something that we want to lay before God. God has mercy and listens to us. You see, we serve a God who always takes time to listen to you. And I don't mean like this really shallow listening like a lot of teenagers do, where you get halfway through the conversation, you look at them and go, hey, what did I just say to you? Right? No, God actually listens. He listens. No matter how big your problems are, no matter how small they seem to somebody else, God cares. And what's really interesting about Exodus chapter 2 is in Exodus chapter 2, after being enslaved for a few hundred years, the children of Israel may have very well concluded that God was tired of listening to them. That he didn't care about them anymore. He didn't want to know about their situation. He didn't care about their pain. He didn't care about their struggles. He didn't care about their complaints. And yet the Bible tells us that as they lifted these prayers, as they complained to God about the harshness of their labor, the Bible tells us that God heard them. And more than that, the Bible says there that He knew. Now right here, the Bible doesn't actually specify exactly what God knew, but we know that God knew His people. He knew their struggles. He knew their situation. He knew their desperation. He knew exactly how much they were hurting. And he knew this because he listened to them. This isn't the only time in the Bible that God talks about listening to us, or that somebody talks about how we know God will listen to us. In fact, the Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 4, or excuse me, chapter 5, rather, verse 14, that we have a certain confidence as Christians. It says that we have this confidence that if we ask anything according to his will, that's the caveat there, right? That he hears us. No matter how small, no matter how large, no matter how seemingly insignificant it may be, God hears us and he wants to hear us. He wants us to talk to Him because we know God is one that keeps His commitments. He's committed to us. He's committed to listening to us. I know that in today's world, commitment may seem like a bit of a foreign language word, right? Not a lot of people really understand what true commitment is anymore from the way that we treat relationships to the way that we look at, I mean, for for example, talk about pro athletes, right? It drives me crazy. This is, this is my little off-topic rant. It drives me crazy when athletes spend a year at a place and they don't win right away. And so they're like, well, now I'm mad and I want to trade. Despite the fact that you committed to playing to this, for this team for the next five years, now you're demanding to go play somewhere else. Which, again, I guess is you're right as a professional athlete. I'm not here to harp on that. Uh, but it, it does kind of look at a, a broader picture of today's world doesn't value commitment the same that it used to. God, however does. God is constantly committed to us, and He makes sure that His promises are certain with His people. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11-13 through 13 says, This saying is trustworthy, for if we died with Him, we will also live with Him. If we endure, we will also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He will deny us. But watch this. If we are faithless, He remains faithful. For he cannot deny himself. That means when we walk away from God, when we decide that we want to pursue our own agenda, when we decide that we want to pursue our own priorities, when we look at God and say, God, I just don't want to deal with you today. Right? I think it's time you and I take a break. I think we just need some space. I want to see other people. Right? Whatever cliche you want to put there, when you decide, when I decide that it's time that I finally walk away from God, the Bible tells us that we may walk away, but God does not walk away from us. He stays there ready to embrace the people that turn back to Him. 
because even when you and I are faithless, He is faithful. He demonstrates His mercy because even when we get so caught up in our own sin to the point that we don't know which way is up, God listens to us. We also know that God demonstrates His mercy in leading. Exodus actually begins with kind of outlining the suffering of the children of Israel. And then we read about how God calls Moses in the non-burning bush and says, Hey, look, you're going to be the leader of the Israelites. You're going to be the ones that, that kind of take my people out of captivity, which then sets up the stage for the, the, you know, really the fun part. I call it the fun part of Exodus, right? It's the VBS part that we like to look at. But the, the ten plagues, right? All of these miracles that are performed and, and how the plagues affect Egypt. And that all kind of sets the stage for the physical exodus of the people, right? And I think that that's really interesting. But if you look at a a verse here in Exodus chapter 13 and verse 17, now this is arguably a verse that unless you've heard somebody specify, it's a verse that as you're reading the book of Exodus, is really easy to gloss over. It's really easy to look at this verse and say, well, that's really not important. But it says here, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them along the road to the land of the Philistines, even though it was nearby. For God said that people will change their minds and return to Egypt if they face war. Now the reason this is really interesting is because although it probably doesn't dawn on us a lot of the time, there were very well-established roads and travel routes in the ancient Near Eastern world. Okay, It was not as though they were just wandering through the desert for the sake of wandering through the desert. There were specific routes that people knew about that they could take. So a lot of the Israelites were probably wondering, why aren't we taking the shortest route? Nearly every single biblical scholar, it is almost unanimous, which is very rare in the scholarly world for something to be unanimous, but it's almost unanimous that the trip that the Israelites were supposed to take from the borders of Egypt to the borders of Canaan should have taken anywhere from 5 to 11 days. That's it. That is almost, if not completely, unanimous amongst biblical scholars. Anybody remember how long it took? Right, A trip that was supposed to take 5 to 11 days, anybody remember how long it took? It took them 40 years. Now look, I've been a youth minister, I've traveled with people with small bladders, but five days to 40 years seems like a bit excessive to me, okay? But it's something that's really interesting because, you may be asking, why is it? Why did it such a short trip take them for so long? It's because God is leading them. God is taking the Israelites and the land to Canaan in the way that He wants them to go. And the lesson there, sometimes we don't want to acknowledge this, sometimes we don't like the hard way, but the lesson there is that sometimes God is going to take us places we don't want to go in order to teach us lessons that we don't want to learn. All right, you guys ever tried to, the, the, the old adage that you can lead a horse to water but you can't make him drink, if you guys ever try to teach a toddler how to do something, right, and the toddler's not having it, right? Sometimes a toddler doesn't want to learn a lesson, right? And no matter what kind of, you know, crying and pleading and and whatever else you do, you're not going to make the toddler learn a particular lesson if they don't want to learn it. A lot of times, you and I act like, I'm not going to say we are, we act like spiritual toddlers, Sometimes God leads us down a way that we know we're supposed to go, but it's a hard way, and we're going to learn lessons that we don't want to learn, and yet God is leading us that way because He knows that's what we need. You see, we sometimes get caught up in this false expectation that life is going to be easy. Right? I, don't, I don't know why we get caught up in that, that scheme, but we get caught up in this, this fake expectation that life is going to be easy. I don't know if you can relate to this, but I do. I remember as a kid at times thinking, man, when I grow up, this is all just going to be easier, right? When I, when I get older, temptation won't bother you as much because I'm older. I won't struggle as much as I used to. I'll be more mature. I'll have more commitment. I'll just, everything in life will be easier as, when, I, when I get older, right? There's a, if anybody in here has ever seen Frozen 2, there's a whole song dedicated to that, right? I, everything will be better when I'm older. And then we grow up and it's like, joke's on you, right? Because you grow up and, and surprise, there are some things that get easier, right? But then in so many other ways, life just gets harder as you get older. You see, sometimes we need to be led along a path that we don't want to go on because God knows that it's only through struggle and suffering that we actually become stronger. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8 says, Although he was the son, talking to Jesus, he learned obedience from what he suffered. 
Jesus had to experience the same sort of things that we do today because He wasn't dying as God, He was dying as man. And it was God's mercy on the world that Jesus suffered on the cross. Jesus didn't want to experience the cross and everything that that entailed, right? The physical pain, the separation from God, Jesus didn't want that to happen, which is why He prayed, God, if there's any other way for You to accomplish this, please, please, let it be that way. But we all know that Jesus cared more about submission to God than his own personal well-being. And so because of that, he went along the way that God led. Same chapter there in Exodus chapter 13, verses 21 and 22. This is also really interesting. It says, The Lord went ahead of them in a pillar uh, of cloud and led them on their way during the day in a pillar of fire at night to give them light at night so they could travel by day or by night. The pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night, never left its place in front of the people. You see, whenever the people of Israel became confused or dismayed or scared or discouraged or they felt like they were lost, they weren't sure which direction they were supposed to go, they could always look up and see God, the light, leading them. The same way is true for us today. Even when that light doesn't seem all that obvious, right? Because sometimes we, we look up Looking for God, we're trying to find the light. Maybe we're looking in the wrong direction. The light's behind us. We've got to turn and, and fixate and focus on where that light is. Looking to God, but that light is always there. It says the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Watch this. Never left its place. It never left its place. God is always there. We just have to be willing to look for and find Him. And then lastly, you understand that God demonstrates His mercy through legislating. Now, I, I have been on record here several times of telling people that the reason that I've never been able to read through the Bible completely, like just sit down and read from Genesis all the way to Revelation, even when you space it out, as I do really good in Genesis, I actually do pretty good in Exodus, but then you get to like Leviticus, you get to Chronicles, and it's just like, you know, there's so many laws that I just, we just don't care about anymore. You get to the Chronicles, and it's just this person begat, this person begat, 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 begat. And it's just, it's, it's almost overwhelming. But one of the really interesting things about Exodus is that about half the book of Exodus is laws. And you look at all these, at first glance, it, it just seems boring, right? I mean, I, I've been there. I've, I've done it. It does seem boring, but all those laws actually play a bigger purpose. You see, those laws function, much like we talked about last week with the idea of warnings. They don't exist to restrict our lives, but they're supposed to enrich our principles. They are supposed to allow us to see the things that need to be prioritized. And so, that, uh, so we have written for us in a way that we can follow God in the way that He wants to be followed, right? There are things that are written down for us. The same thing was true for the people of Israel. They were written laws so that they could follow God in the way that He wanted them to be followed. The same is true for us today. God writes out for us the way He wants to be followed. And generally, what is revealed through the law is that God is seeking to do something in us more than He is seeking to do something for us. Right? We, we constantly are looking at this idea of Christianity as what, what can God do for me? Right? I don't remember who it was, right? Who was it? Was it what, what can Brown do for me? Is that was the old expression? Yes, no? Okay, I'm getting some nods. So I'm going to go with that. This side of the room can be blamed if I got that incorrect because they nodded yes. Um, but yeah, we treat God the same way. What can God do for me? What can you do for me, God? If I dedicate my life to you, what are you going to do for me? How are you going to make my life easier? And God says, whoa, whoa, you've got it all wrong. The end result will be far better for you, right? You are going to leave this world. You're going to inherit a place where you get to be in eternal fellowship with me, and it's all going to be better. But while you're living here, God says, I'm not seeking to do something for you. I'm seeking to do something in you. I want to change your life. I want you to live out a way that people see that there is something different about you, that there is something being done in you that allows you to live your life with a different outlook than everybody else around you. One of the biggest problems that the world has today is its view of God, like what I like to call a buffet. Right, we tr I love a buffet. Like y'all could probably tell, I understand. I love a good buffet. Uh, anytime I get a chance to go eat Chinese food, I take it because Chelsea's got to be in like a very specific mood. Otherwise, it's just not going to happen. But I, I love a good buffet. The problem is, is the world tends to treat God like that buffet, in the sense that we expect God to give us what we want, when we want it, 
at the price that we are willing to pay, and we get to leave everything that we deem undesirable there at the buffet, and we don't have to partake in any of that, right? Because, there, I mean, everybody's got it. You go to the Chinese buffet, there's some stuff that you're just like, I don't know where that's been. I don't want to touch it, right? We get it. The problem is, is that God sets a standard for a greater way of living, and that standard is what allows us to experience life to the fullest. It's not pick and choose what you want. It's accept God all. Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 through 6, God says, or, or the, the law says there, Do not make an idol for yourself, whether in shape of anything in the heavens above or on the earth below or in the waters under the earth. Do not bow and worship to them. Do not serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, bringing the consequences of the father's iniquity on the children to the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing faithful love to a thousand generations of those who who love and keep my commandments. And you're like, well, Nathan, that seems kind of harsh, right? Because God, you just said, God is a God of mercy. That's part of who He is. And He says that I'm jealous. I'm going to bring consequences on the father, uh, the father's iniquity on the children to three and, and four generations. That doesn't seem very merciful at all. You look at the last part of that verse, though, because God says that those that are faithful to Him will receive love for a thousand generations to those who keep his commandments. You see, the funny thing is, at, at first glance, it's funny to me anyway, how much it seems that God despises uh, physical idols or statues. Uh, I actually got to looking into this a little bit. Most scholars will tell you that, that modern day Christianity, right, is one of the only, if not the only, world religion that rejects the use of physical emblems or statues as a way to moderate worship through to a God, right? And I just, I find that really interesting, but I think the reason behind that is not because God is afraid of people worshiping a statue, but it's because that's not how we're supposed to treat God. God is not physical, and therefore is not to be worshiped through physical means. That's why John chapter 4 tells us that God is a spirit, and those that worship Him must do so in spirit and in truth. What this passage really suggests is that God has an expectation for the way that we behave. And there have been times in my life where I can confidently say, I don't know what's best for me. Like, I thought I knew what was best for me. I thought I was sure at the time I knew exactly what was best for me. And I'll just be honest, it did not turn out well. Right? There are things, I'm sure somebody in here can, can, can sympathize with me in that regard, that you knew what was going to be best for you, and it turned out that that was something that really, really was not good. And so many times in my life, I found myself getting in a lot of trouble because I thought I was doing the correct thing. Which is why the Bible tells in the book of Proverbs that there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end leads to death. There is a way that you and I can rationalize that is going to say, no, that makes perfect sense. we got to do it this way. But if it's contrary to what God has put in front of us, it's not how we're supposed to live. Part of the mercy of God is that He lays out with full disclosure what He expects from us and how we live. You see, the beauty of God is that His mercy is not solely displayed in the way He forgives sins. And I love that. Like I love that God forgives sins, but I love that His mercy is not contained in one individual thing that He does. It's not solely displayed in the way He forgives sin. It's not solely displayed uh, in how He shows kindness to us, even though we could write a list of our shortcomings a mile long. It's not solely displayed in the way that He loves us, despite at times how poorly we treat Him. But His mercy is wrapped up in every single aspect of who God is. How He leads us, even though, uh, excuse me, how He leads us knowing the best possible way for us to be led, how He listens to us through our suffering, how He makes His laws known so that we can better understand His nature and participate in His will. God is a God of mercy. And that's something to be incredibly grateful for, that you and I serve a God of mercy. So this morning, if you want to experience that mercy in a deeper way by recommitting your life to Him, or for the very first time, if there's any need that you have, won't you come as we stand and as we sing? Why keep Jesus waiting, waiting in the cold? He will bear you gently, 
Gently to his fold, see him soul and open, I implore. Why keep Jesus waiting, waiting at the door? Oft he knocketh softly, softly o'er and o'er. Hear him, soul, on open, I implore. Why keep Jesus waiting, knocking at the door? Soon he'll cease his pleading, yes, forevermore. Come, poor soul, obey him, I am.